Small Baby is my third novel and the sequel of sorts to my debut novel, Umbar, The Question of Red. It has many aspirations and themes, many of which are the fictions I have told and retold for over a decade about parents and children, origins, differences, margins, love, passion, illegitimacy, and belonging. If The Question of Red is the story of the mother and the father, Four Baby is the story of the daughter. Toward the end of The Question of Red, which is a love story set against the backdrop of the Indonesian anti-communist mass massacres of 1965, we learn that Srikandi or Siri is the love baby of Amba and Bishma, the protagonist of The Question of Red. Um, they were violently separated in 1965, after which Amba found out that she was pregnant. Then she met this German American social scientist Adelhard Eilers, who agreed to marry her and father her child. Now, in Four Baby, we learned that Srikandi or Siri only knows about the truth of her origin close to the age of 50. Now, I have been a single parent to a daughter for many years, and I also found out late in life that I was adopted. So, parenthood and adoption are very important themes in my life, a light motif, if you will. I've always been interested in how an adoption deeply affects all the parties involved, whether it be the adopted child, the adoptive parents or the biological parents, especially if the circumstances of the adoption were painful, difficult or complicated. It raises questions such as trust, allegiance and the social gaze and what sort of fiction people resort to to justify life. At the same time, I've always been intrigued by the notion that children often cannot escape the fate of their parents, however much they try, and that the pain of historical trauma spreads from generation to generation. I think it was Hertha Müller who said, it often becomes the child's task to mourn because the parents can't, or they have their limits. They survive, but they are frozen, holding their breasts for 40 years, not really alive. It is the job of the children, representing the dead. If in the question of red, I found the way in, so to speak, by using the Hindu epic Mahabharata to talk about war within a family and linking it to the official lies and propaganda constructed by the Suharto regime around the massacres of 65 to justify his dictatorship, in Four Baby, I found a way in through art. To me, looking at art is like looking at mythology. It is about acknowledging different ways of seeing. Even within one person, there reside multiple selves and identities. And it is this nature of seeing that allows Siri to slowly make sense and even make peace of her past and her parents' history and of her own relationship with history. She learns, for instance, to know her biological father, Bishma, whom she never knew, through the act of imagining him, of painting him. She learns to understand anew her relationship with all the women in her life, her mother, Amba, her stepdaughter Amalia and her best friend turned foe, the political activist Dara, who is the other protagonist of the novel. Now, I created Dara because I wanted to tell the story of another type of modern Indonesian woman. On the surface, they couldn't be more different. Siri travels, a creature of East and West. Dara is more firmly rooted. Siri has a thoroughly liberal, progressive, westernized upbringing, whereas Dara comes from a conservative Muslim background, but is liberal progressive in her politics. Siri is an artist, Dara is an activist. They're different in personalities and background, but essentially are fighting for the same values, which are freedom and democracy. So when intolerant religious groups threaten to ban Siri's exhibition in Jakarta, Dara and Siri have to make, uh, to put aside their differences and work together. Well, having these two characters as well as the focus on art allow me to tackle one more concern, which is rising intolerance. Between 2015 and 2017, when I was living in Berlin, right-wing extremism was on the rise in Germany. Trump happened, Brexit happened, back home in Jakarta, there was a disheartening return to Suharto-era troops of neurosis and repression. Society had become more polarized in matters of race, ethnicity, religion, and belief. And those were particularly bad years for art as well. Art exhibitions, transgender cultural uh, gatherings, public statues deemed pornographic were cracked down on. Anti-communism, anti-Chinese, as an anti-LGBTQ uh, were on the rise. Yet artists continue to wear the courage and the intelligence of their resistance, as they've always done in the face of injustice and repression. So this is why I wanted to tell the story of an artist and how artists can offer a fresh pair of eyes through which to see the world and make a difference. 
By being in Berlin, Sili can also compare the way Germans, also plagued by a history of violence, and Indonesians deal with their dark past. How indeed do different generations in different societies process historical memory? Siri, how did I come to art? Was there a print prick of time in which I just knew? Artists often evade this question. They either find it lazy or are too lazy to answer it. But not me, for I was always clear on the moment and on my two guiding spirits. One was very famous, the other practically unknown. One day in the late 70s, when I was 13, a man I would never see again came to our house in Jakarta with a painting of a woman who looked like my mother. My mother had blushed so deeply that at first I thought they were having an affair. I watched her usher him into the living room. They exchanged very few words. She put a hand on my arm the way she rarely did. Go fetch your father. Why? Tell him an old friend of mine from Job Jakarta has come to visit. I glanced at the canvas he had with him, but she didn't do too good a job in covering. Neither did he do too good a job in not staring at me, as if he needed to verify something. He smelled of kretek and decay, and there was something in his eyes that was from another world. Srikandi, my mother said, as she always did when she wanted to make a point. I sighed, got up, and did as I was bid. After I got my father, or Bapa as I called him, to come out to greet our guest, all three of them went to his study and closed the door. I saw how warm Bapa was towards the man because he was always that warm and how tense my mother was. The next morning, when I went to Baba's study, with my mother at my heels, I found myself staring at a face on the wall that was unmistakably my mother's. My father must have mounted it sometime in the night when I was asleep. And because I was just standing there, not moving, Baba looked up from the book he was reading and said, The man who came yesterday. He's a painter, and his name is Ibra. He painted your mother sometime in the 60s when she went to visit him in Jakarta with a, a, a friend. I asked my mother and my father whether he was famous, this painter called Ibra, whether the painting had a title. Just as my father had paused before the word friend, he started to explain, haughtingly, me, looking at my mother now and then. I vaguely heard him say, the blue widow your mother insisted on that title after everything that happened but I wasn't really listening and the school bus had arrived and I had to get going so I said later pa bye but I remember looking one last time at my mother's face on the wall so like how I saw her but had never realized I'd seen her green bleeding into red copperish turning into fire the blue but the faintest roots. I also remember the look on my mother's face as she realized what I saw in my thinking as I ran out of the door and kissed her cheek. Why do you need to be so sad, Ibu, when you're so clearly red, so clearly glowing? But secrets are like colors. Look closely and they tell a thousand stories. A watershed never announces itself, it just feels like one. But a habit, I'm sure that's what it was, was forming since that moment in my father's study. A habit of the double take, of stopping in front of a painting, of reading into it, sometimes a bit too much. The misreading often being intended. But how else to know what we cannot know? I'm not sure how much the change in my mother had to do with it. What made for her sudden acknowledgement of my gaze? What was cause? false effect. Did my mother change because of my newfound interest or did I become interested in the new thing because of the change in her? But it happened and it happened as a kind of vengeance. 
a sudden happiness often demands. What happened was that we went around town and looked at a lot of art. There was a quiet urgency about her, my mother, as if she hadn't quite planned it, but now that she was on a mission, she was determined to fix what had been her crime of neglect in the first place. She would pack me into my father's company car, mostly on a Sunday or a Saturday afternoon, and take me to the homes of people I'd never met. People who never came to our home. People who were obviously her friends, not my father's. People who are artists, she told me, for artists are a little different than people. It was obvious to me even then that those artists, those people who weren't quite people, had liked us. Or maybe they'd simply taken us in their stride because that's what they do, think nothing of other people. Some were generous. They fed us and gave me little clay molds to take home. Still, it didn't mean I was any wiser to their backstory. How did they meet my mother? How did she come to know so many artists? But it was clear that they trusted my mother's judgment, even though she was neither an expert nor an artist. Your mother has the eye of an artist, one of them told me. One that is free. They were nice to me too, as far as any appendage to a parent could be tolerated. I was the girl with potential, though as yet without an eye and a voice of her own. But I didn't mind being seen that way. It was harder, as I later learned, to know so much in silence. In all those weeks, only one particular work leaped at me. It was a collection of drawings, no more than two dozen, like snapshots from a family album. It just lay there on the artist's desk, unselfish, unassuming. So you like them, I heard a voice behind me. I turned around and saw a lean, tallish man, somewhere in his sixties. So you like this, he said, pointing to the drawings, a single down. And this, the sleeping gardener, a scene from a television monitor, a woman in a pale blue dress asleep with a young child. Why did you like this and not this? Or this? All the time he was smoking right into my face as people did to other people's children in those days because that was what they did to their own children. At one point he got up and fetched an old calendar from the pile on his desk. He showed me the back of it, full of his notes in small neat handwriting. It looked like parts of a diary. He pointed at a poem, something he'd written that seemed dear to him. He didn't ask me to read it, but of course I did. It was about a burning love and it made me blush. Meanwhile, my mother paid us almost no heed, all her attention on the larger canvases crowding the studio. I watched her regard them one by one, taking in their sweep and their details, the labour not just of hand, limb and eye, but also of memory and reflection. She seemed so taken by some of these words to the point of deference and purposefully stayed clear of others. There was something strange in the way she avoided the news. It was as though she felt the artist had crossed a line, as though she was personally violated. But I liked him. I liked him. I liked his long, lean face, his unsettling calm, the way his eyes and mouths played up to each other, the way his pipe just kind of held on to the corner of his mouth, the way he kept smoking into my face. Later, my, my mother told me his name was Sindhu Darsono Sujoyano, and that he was possibly the greatest artist our country had ever produced. He was also among the unluckiest and the luckiest who had been both spanked and spared by politics, by ideology, by family, by all the forces in one's life that could bury or keep one alive. Okay, I said, but what did it have to do with the way he drew or painted? It didn't even matter what he knew or saw. You have a point, she said. But one day you understand that when an artist paints two women he loved this way or that, and in the nude, it often has nothing to do with whether he loved one more than the other. For love never loves again the same way. And because I didn't counter her, she told me that one day I will also understand why love makes us seek and reject paintings at the same time. I take it you're speaking from experience, I said. Why is there such a thing as luck? She said. Why is there such a thing as talent? I said. I could have kept up the repost because something in her was almost crying for me too. Oh, 
but what do I know anyway? I said instead. I'm only 13 after all. A few days later, she told me, there's this painting of his, of his first wife, that always vexes me. On the surface, it's so serene, a sitting in a rocking chair, in a pale pink kabaya, sewing, pregnant, willfully lost, it seems, in the domesticity of her life. What's vexing is that when I look closely at her face, I can only see her as an old woman. This always makes me sad. I don't know why that is. Remember what I told you when we first met the artist at his house eight years ago about painting the two women you love. Well, Sujoyono married twice. He painted both of them, the first and the second wife, intimately. You'd suppose she'd love them both, equally, differently. Stranger that never saw his second wife in any of his paintings as old, not even when I was staring at a painting of her as an older woman. Now, isn't that bizarre? My mother's happiness didn't last long, vanishing as soon as it came. I always expected it, that folding back into her dark blue self. But this didn't change the facts for me. Ever since a painter called Ibra brought a painting of my mother to our house, I knew I would live a painter's life. Berlin, March 2016. Outside my apartment building, there are five Stolpersteine arranged in the shape of a diamond. They lie quietly on the pedestrian sidewalk, which is their very point, to be chanced upon, to shine upon a life briefly, if at all, among the unseen living. We step on them every day on our way somewhere, unaware, the way we often live, oblivious of repeating the same mistakes. One night, as I was heading back to my apartment, ahead of me was a couple walking and kissing. They went at it loudly and feverishly, and I was sure they'd go on until they hit something or until something hit them, a bus or a freak thunderstorm or, heaven forbid, a spouse. I then saw both of them drawing away from each other for a split second, just before reaching the spot, only to re-engage immediately afterwards. Now and then, a few locals have come to know also make a point of veering from their path exactly at this instant, whenever something makes them remember. A muscle memory, a limpid moment. Something about this instinct moves me. Back home, we were taught never to put anything valuable on the ground for fear of befouling it or for inviting bad luck. Whenever someone puts something as trivial as a handbag on the floor, there will be people rushing towards a desecrated object at pains to offer to put it on a chair on some kind of a covering to restore its respectability. Even more so with food. Crude are those who put their takeaway bags on the floor, especially those containing food freshly prepared, sometimes unthinkingly along with the other shopping bags. Can't you hear the food crying? As for the memory of the dead, it goes without saying, you should never step on graves, even when avoiding them in a crowded public cemetery is often impossible. Once, I saw a little boy slapped so hard by his father when his feet landed upon a headstone in the crush of families visiting the graves of relatives before the fasting months began. Knowing where they are, I've taught myself not to step on the Stolpersteiner outside my apartment building. But this precisely being the point, of course, I too often forget. For their part, these brass-plated stones often glint their way into my vision in the saddest, coldest, or most besotted of nights. And whenever this happens, I often wonder if I would ever be able to walk the street in Jakarta or in Buru, knowing that I could see my father's name here or there, on a busy street or in a hidden nook, or if I would ever see in it a future memorial on a giant plaque, along with the names of four the fallen others, whether it would change me, and if yes, how.
Folks back home have been talking for a while about building a memorial for the victims of the anti-communist massacres of 1965. The actors change all the time, of course, even though that isn't important. What is important is that we know the actors are part of our small community. Besides, we know that nothing will ever get built as long as the thing remembered is not publicly acknowledged in the history books our children will read at school. As usual, you hang on to the goodwill. Sometimes a spoken thing can be as binding as a written word. Sometimes it may even materialize. One day, as I was sitting in the plaza of the memorial to the murdered Jews on one of those grey, solemn, bench-high stele, I overheard a man who just found out his wife had been cheating on him longer than he had been cheating on her, crying into his cell phone. A little boy, no older than five, who had previously been running and climbing with the other children, stopped and stood beside him, asking whether he was okay, if there was anything he could do to help. There was something about the boy's gesture, the concern on his face, that made the grieving man break down even further. In no time, I saw a woman hurrying towards the boy in a state of sunburn anxiety, take him by the arm and whisk him away, away and out of sight. Everywhere around us, people were busy doing something, chatting, checking messages, eating. 10 minutes went by, the sun was harsh. I could feel the air stilling. I suddenly felt wobbly, unsupported in the open. As I stood, I heard a voice behind me. It's so austere, isn't it? I turn around. It was a middle-aged woman with thick, big, blonde hair, tortoise shell glasses. American, judging from the accent. She must have guessed from the book I carried that I spoke English. Yes, I say. You know, the names. If you're looking for them, they're down at the information center, right beneath us. It took a while to understand what she was telling me. But then, of course, she was referring to the names of the victims of the Holocaust. A less generous mind, of course, would be too quick to read a stark visual absence as morally indefensible, to be so deferential to all that subtle aesthetics but something about her restrained and quiet confidence moved me. Or was it something else I heard? Some kind of an internalized invisibility? Suddenly, my eyes began to water. Bisma, Rashad, I suddenly heard myself say. That was my father's name. He died in Buru Island in 2000. We didn't get to ask each other's names until much later, when after a walk we somehow just fell into, because I was in tears and she had been kind, we stopped at a cafe and had a beer. She was a professor of literature. This was the start of a sabbatical and she'd come to Berlin to visit her parents who lived in Potsdam. Both her maternal grandparents had perished in Auschwitz. We traded name cards and promised to write each other. For a while, that was my way of making friends in the city, as if I had thrown everything to the wind and watched where it would take me. In the first two weeks, everything was a blur. I cried and stayed in bed a lot. It was as if I had forgotten why I was there, what I had hoped to find. To be fair to myself, my tears were generally called for. I missed my father at our heart, our long conversations, his face. I miss Rias too, and had never loved him as much as I did then, when every poignant little thing about him, every poignant little thing that hadn't moved me enough when I was living with him, rose to the surface. But some were unexpected. Why did I worry about Amalia, for instance? Amalia, my stepdaughter who had been the light of my life when she was tiny, but from whom I later strayed for reasons that for the most part remain unclear, even to me. Amalia, whose lightning alliance was that backstabbing snake, Dara Aji, 
troubled me in a way I couldn't put a finger on, even though her being with Dara now meant she was in a safe place. Amalia, who in seeking that refuge had also left my mother in a lurch, as if she wanted nothing to do with my side of the family anymore. In fact, why dream at all when the only kind of dream I had was of being hunted down or captured, or both, and always for the things I hadn't done or had neglected to do. In one such dream, I was chased through an interminable apocalyptic landscape from forest to forest, from paddy field to paddy field, and ultimately hacked to death, or so it felt like, by a linguist fascist serial killer. In another, I was thrown into jail by the Sharia police in Aceh, featuring a religious symbol on my latest exhibition and actually forgetting to skewer or deface or piss on them. In yet another, I was on trial for blasphemy for inviting members of the audience to fuck me during my performance and was handed a sentence five times harsher than demanded by the prosecutor, not for inviting members of the audience to fuck me, but because I hadn't worn my headscarves throughout whilst I was at it. Most nights, sleep eluded me completely. I contacted no one, hardly left my neighbourhood, did not take a single step towards setting up a life for myself, other than having a roof over my head. At first, I didn't even quite know what to make of my studio apartment in Schlossenburg only that I'd managed to secure it and that I was lucky to have done so. Most artists moving to Berlin in search of a new life would have moved to Neukölln for its vibrant multi-ethnicity, or to Moabit or Wedding, where they could easily get hold of an old etage factory and turn it into a studio at a low cost. But there was a patina to this part of Schlossenburg between Kahnstrasse and Pudam whose allure defied reason. The space itself has a sort of careless asceticism that I dislike. It also has some really bad art. Yet it's a corner studio on the first floor, a perfect L-shape dominated by wide door-sized windows overlooking two leafy streets. Those streets don't only sparkle in the sun, but also sent waves of colours into the room that my canvas cannot emulate. But I was blind to all of that. I couldn't decide whether it was dumb dumb, glam, or a glorified dumb, a fine or a ruse. I did not know how to occupy, much less to live in it. It wasn't until mid-April that I finally had Putri, my assistant in Jakarta, send the silica moulds of my best sculptures to Berlin just so I could have some leverage or a starting point. Putri did so with nary a squeak to DJ, my former gallerist cum dealer, on whose payroll she was until he and I had our epic blowout and she begged for me to steal her. Not that I ever needed his permission. Even before I fired him, he was pretty darn useless. We last talked at a poolside party thrown by an eminent art collector and he was drunk. He told me with his drug lay smoky breath that if only I could do 20 paintings in two years, like any self-respecting artist, if I was less of a tortured loner and more like this other Indonesian artist who was so agreeable, so easy, who just had a solo show in New York and sold all his work in a week, he might actually start doing his job properly. I told him never to talk like me, never to talk to me like that again. But instead of shutting up, he said, you think you owe Bob everything, but it was Bob who ruined you. He made you lazy. Bob was my first dealer, back when the term art dealer still seemed a lowly, purely mercenary pursuit. And it was he who found me my first few steady collectors during the first art boom, the early 2000s. He had his faults, but he always took care of me. He would never let my works go unsold at an auction for instance, or let me be without a show for more than three months. When he suddenly collapsed and died in front of me after a post-show dinner in 2009, something in me died along with him. 
barely 10 minutes after he paid our last restaurant bill, he said it again, his favorite quote from a book called The Lives of a Sin. If an elephant missteps and dies in an open place, the herd will not leave him there. So, what DJ said was simply unforgivable. I should have poured gasoline on him, throw a burning match and pushed him into the pool. That piece of live art alone would have tripled my worth in an instant. Instead, I grabbed another glass of wine and tapped the ashes from my cigarette onto his feet, watching the embers glow and die on his black and gold pair of my keys. From now on, I'll represent myself, I said. Go and fuck up someone else's career. Now that I knew the first thing about how to represent myself. I hope you know what you're doing with those molds, Putri has said right after sending them. And of course, I had no clue what I was doing with those molds, even if I didn't tell her that. I didn't know what to do with anything. I mean, if only she could see me now. If only DJ could see me now. If only my beloved Bob could see me now, cowering at the slightest noise or movement, keeping mum as to where I live, quivering over the names of wines and food in French or German or Italian, as if I'd just heard of a continent called Europe. I don't know why I behave like a psychotic then, still less why I'm still behaving like a psychotic now. There's no point in recasting those molds if I'm not about to exhibit them soon. There's no point in anything as if I'm going to cry and brood and eat away savings that I don't even have. The point of now is to live or to live again, as love loves to advocate. And the first rule is not to complain, least of all about where I live. And this has to be said. I get to live where I want to live, around bookstores, family restaurants, and a lot of people with white hair. No amount of bad art and careless asceticism can change that. And the space isn't without her wiles. She courts me patiently, in silence, waiting for me to be surprised. When I finally come around, I see that she's radiant and that her beauty is not a right. Suddenly, I'm in my own secret, and she's complicit, which is that I've never lived with so much sunlight indoors, even if I come from the tropics. It's as if I was born on the wrong side of the earth, seeing only now all the loveliness I should have seen all my life. And so it was, in those early days, that I might have laid down at night and cried and cried without knowing why. I thought it would be the way of things for a long time. Then I never closed the curtain for fear of missing the few warming touch of the morning. Curse be those who shun such a gift. Besides, spring has come uncommonly early to Berlin this year, and with it the most brilliant sunlight of any European springs I've known. There is plenty to be grateful for. And so, time does its work. The sadness becomes less. The body and the heart adapt. I begin to listen to the music and the noise around me. Sometimes it's a distraction. Other times, it punctuates my loneliness. Sometimes it's welcome. Dara, Jakarta, October 2016. I'm a hick at heart and there is something to Sundays that reminds me of my rural hometown in central Java. 
of easy days at the market and leisurely foraging in our backyard, of long hours on the football field and nights sweetened by the scent of tuberose. The hours of malaise my city slicker friends speak of are alien to me, but too late. There is a new case and they need me back in my office in Jakarta early on Monday morning. And the moment was marked, for there I am, 24 hours early, on the night train from Solo, about to pull into Gumbir station at the crack of dawn. I could have stayed on in Magalang until Sunday night, had my brother Ramdas, and milk my ancestral weekend in the countryside for all its work. But the idea of going straight from the train station into work the next day is even more depressing than spending my Sunday in a sullen, urban-induced coma. A one-day advance trip, that's all you need to lessen the pain. And it pays, at least over the blur of traffic and industrial ways of the last stretch, there have been intimations of a sunrise, not unlike the one I grew up with, the glimmer of concentrated copper before a soft, languorous scattering. Even the city, when properly entered, is a kind of green dystopia, awash with the green helmets of the new economy's two-wheeled transport brigade. I might not read the world in colour the way artists do, or certain artists say they do, but I know enough of it to love these guys. They are our handmaids and our unicorns. They carry the city's struggle, so this portion would cheer. They are my day's best hope. Not all is lost. As I said, the moment is marked. Late Saturday afternoon, the National Commission on Violence Against Women called to my office, Hakiki. Hakiki called me. I gathered my things, said goodbye to my brother's family and went back to Jakarta. Hakiki is a non-profit organization I co-founded 20 years ago during the height of the underground opposition against the Suharto regime. It does everything that falls under human rights, especially women's. We get hundreds of these calls every day, but with domestic abuse, Every ordinary case is extraordinary. This case then, two men, one woman, urban professionals, fairly well off, mid forties. The woman came home, found her husband in bed with her brother. A concerned neighbor called the commission. Epic shit is about to hit the fan, she said, if it hasn't already. Could you send someone over to pre prevent it? During the Monday briefing, I was told that the commission had specifically requested me. Because you know how these people think, they explained. I arrive at the site of the crime sometime around noon. The carnage had already taken place, photographed, dusted, imprinted. Instead of stabbing her brother, who had a wife and a child aged seven, the woman stabbed her husband, with whom she had four children, some 29 times. Now it was hard to shake off the details of the scene. The dead man lying face down on the floor, a mesh of blood shards in a sickly brownish substance. The man whose life was spared, crouching in the corner, shaking, blood streaming down his fingers. He might have put up a fight on behalf of his lover and so good on him. The woman, Pacing around the room, her eyes bloodshot and aggrieved. Yes, grief. We women never mistake grief for anything else. The knife lying on the floor in the middle of the room and all the other particulars of the life that once was. The prayer mat kicked aside. The framed photos of the kids and their beaming parents all flecked with blood. Marked, changed forever. It took forever to get anything out of the woman. She was too much in shock to make sense of anything. But by late evening, she told me something that seemed to make absolute sense to me. Of course it had to be my husband. I killed him and not my brother because he soiled my bloodline. He had no right to do that. Maybe they hadn't been wrong to ask specifically for me. It seems I do understand how these people think. That same night, as I was drafting my report of the crime, a personal message popped up on my messenger page. It was from Guardian, that old podger. Again, a moment marked. 
At first, I thought he was responding to my earlier post, a scathing line on a new polygamy bill being pushed in the local parliament of Pamikasan in Madura, East Java. I hadn't even started tackling all the comments. Or maybe he was on one of his anti-communist vendettas, throwing in his lot with the army. I saw there was a new communist alert on the army's official website. This time, was a slew of so-called evidence coming from South Sumatra. This time, was a slew of so-called evidence coming from South Sumatra. Communists have the devil's way of transmuting, metamorphosing, rearranging, and perpetuating themselves, pervading all layers of society, the document said. Guardian is a real piece of work. He's in his mid-70s, cranky, a class action suit waiting to happen. God knows how many people is insulted on social media for disagreeing with him. But he's not the only one in a city full of cranky, septuagenarian, class action suits waiting to happen. The city is bursting at the seams with people like him, who once upon a time made a mark on the political scene for something they said or did, but who now has nothing better to do than jump at every issue that makes the Twitter rounds and piles on all the garbage. The difference between him and the others is that he's lived and outlived them all. Pre-democratic, democratic, post-democratic. Post he's beyond saving, for sure, even if there's some relief in the fact that he's continued to wield no real political power. Over three decades, he was chairperson of this, board member of that, neither the institution nor his particular tenure resounding in history, not even in my magnanimous memory. He's abused me plenty, for sure. Accused me of everything under the sun. Pandering to salon socialists just because I was quiet more than once having dinner in a Chi-Chi neighborhood at some rich friend's joint. Being soft on heretics because I wrote an article in defense of a woman under a death fatwa in Bandung with Angelina Jolie and Queen Rania of Jordan on her, list, on her list of most admired women ahead of Aisha the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, being a closet lesbian because the fact that I have no children suggests my marriage is a sham. Another message. What now, you old fart? The first line of the last message has the word nude in it. Something leaped within me. Could this be about those nude sculptures? Serious nude sculptures? That was where I should have moved on, continued with my report, outlined a defense for the woman who stabbed her husband, whoever the lawyer was going to be. Help those geniuses in the local parliament of Pamukkas and do their gender inequality math. Told them that if there were 20,000 more women than men living in Pamukkas, it didn't mean more men should marry more than one woman. It simply meant, hang on, guardian again. And again, I squinted, still not daring to click, still not wishing to be entrapped. Suppose I click, read through, and not reply. Suppose I just risk it, the knowing and the unknowing. I clicked. Told you, Rumita says, told you not to click because if you hate, what you see, you can't unclick. In fact, she told me no such thing because no one, not even a 10 year old with a smartphone needs to be told such things because he or she ought to have known. But she's my older sister and even if age has no bearing on wisdom lived and learned, some people wear the respect age confers on them with a pomp. And she's earned my respect as opposed to being entitled to it. Occasionally, she can even be useful. Besides, she sits as a board member of Hakiki. She's used to brainstorming about everything from legal defense for a physically abused Indonesian domestic worker in the heart of Saudi Arabia to the appropriate wedding gift for a colleague. From the appeal for the exhumation of mass communist graves in an East Javanese village to finding an orphan a safe home. Rumita is unmarried, has no child, not even a lover or a pet. This has a curious effect on her. It both softens and hardens her. The older she gets, it seems to be more the case of the former. I think it's because she's given up thinking anybody cares. 
It's also true that she may have a few erroneous views of me. She thinks I'm smart, as in PhD smart, because I grew up sunless and unpleasant and combative. Whereas I'm really not. Smart, that is. I've wasted my 20s attending NGO meetings and study clubs while studying absolutely nothing, barely scraping through my bachelor's degree when all my other friends were breastfeeding less ladies. She thinks I will become a member of the parliament or even a minister because I don't cook, I don't sew, and I talk like a man. She also thinks the reason Mahdi and I don't have children is because ours was a marriage of convenience to begin with. A courageous, genius deal, mainly on my part, signed and sealed his eyes wide open. I provide him a safe harbour because he's too ugly to find a wife. He gives me respectability while continuing to be married to politics. Since children are a labour of love, they should enter no such pact. There is at least some degree of truth in that. Now after a while, I don't attempt to correct these erroneous views in him. My acceptance of her illusions is roughly commensurate with my dwindling genius. But this time, I did tell her. I tell her that if I were a genius, I would have seen what was happening under my nose. I would have sensed something in Amalia's avoiding of my gaze every time I entered the kitchen in the morning, in the brief crimsoning of her cheeks whenever I mentioned his name, in her not attending meetings at the office. I would have been able to connect the dots instead of sitting back there in my so-called office with my colleagues engaging in mindless political gossip while she was out there banging my brother in some bawdy hotel room and being promised the polygamist's ultimate dream. You know what? I think you're more annoyed by the fact that you had to find out from Bergen, Rita says, speaking quickly, not looking at me. What? as opposed to hearing from you or from one of us. Oh, come on, put aside your feelings. You know now, and that's it. There's a lot of danger in what this is. You've got Yaam Bun Rumi. You think I don't know? You think this is about my, my bruised ego? Because my brother and my adopted sister have lain together in sin and lied to me, to my face, and abused my love and trust? Precisely, Rumita says, her voice suddenly hard and inflexible. Until now, he knows enough. He knows enough to bury not just Amalia and Arya, but you and Hakiki and Siri. Oh, you don't have to mention her name. I can't care less if she burns or dies. Well, you kind of have to, says Rumita. You have to make a few statements. Both yours and Hakiki's, or you through Hakiki. We still have time to discuss this, but first you have to talk to Siri, getting her to agree to shut down her exhibition, at least until the whole thing dies down. Do you think she even knows about this or that Amalia would tell her? She's all the way in Berlin doing God knows what. They don't talk to each other, let alone see each other. She only cares about herself and her own shit. Lumita is unperturbed. You also have to sit both Arif and Amalia down and ask them what their plans are, she says sternly. Are you out of your mind? They have no right to their voice, let alone any kind of planning. She's with child, Dara. I hate that she has to remind me. Well, she has a stepmother and two grandmothers, doesn't she? Won't she be taken care of? Besides, that horrible woman who calls her stepmother had it coming all along. Worst mother in the world. I see Romita's jaw opening and slowly closing again. She tolerates most of my shit, but she wouldn't have any such talk about mothers. This is her wake up call, I persist cruelly. Serves her right. She can't just leave a mess and skip town like what she's done all her life. Now she has to come back and clean up her own shit. It is Arif's child she's carrying, which makes it our problem. Siri and I first met at school back in the mid-70s. It was a private school that went on from primary to senior high. 
at the end of which you might feel, if you made it through, that you deserve some kind of lifetime achievement medal. The adversity was real enough and gruesome. You got stuck with the same faces, the same names, the same character traits for a decade, maybe more, which felt like a lifetime because for many of us, life afterwards seemed entirely superfluous, if slightly humiliating. It didn't get any bigger or better. But Siri was different. She was always the strangest and the most splendid of us all. And in the five years that I knew her, all I wanted was to be her bosom friend. In our own way, Siri and I were accidents of history. In my first months in Tirtamata, I was told by my uncle and aunt that I should feel privileged for having attended a Catholic school because not only were my parents Muslims, but they were poor Muslims. And so I had to be brilliant and grateful. Siri's brilliance came from a different starting place. It was a product of what I later learned was a well-to-do Muslim family who could afford the best education, a school where her brilliance would flourish. We were both aware of our respective luck and hated it for different reasons. I resented the fact that this privilege, this identity was only ever on them, whereas Siri resented being made to represent the background that she felt she was being judged on. Once, on an exam day, I was late for school and there was no one to take me. Romita was already in high school and had her own arrangements. One of the neighborhood rich kids took pity on me and procured me a seat on the school bus, which looked like a half-green portable toaster whose engine couldn't stop running once it was started. This was when I found myself sitting next to Siri, who was peering disdainfully at everyone in the bus from behind one of the English language books. She was a funny one. She didn't seem to like people that much. She merely tolerated them. I sensed her shifting in her seat, inching closer to the window, as though she didn't want to risk coming into bodily contact with me. I remember spending almost the entire bus ride worrying that I stank. But some minutes later, I saw her stealing a glance at the book I had with me. It was a beautiful storybook about the adventures of the peasant boy Madi and his animal friends. The author, nicknamed Pat Radin, was my hero. I love his drawings, she suddenly said. He was one of a kind. My favorite book of his is the one about the old man and his 101 cats. Her voice was surprisingly low and pleasant, not my idea of a smarty princess. I'm Siri, she said, though she didn't extend her hand. I said my name with a slight quiver, wondering if she'd be the only Siri I'd ever know. My father and my mother were lean, sun-browned, no-nonsense people, their noses flat and their features indistinct and just as well. Beauty didn't mean a jot in our town back home if you didn't make yourself useful. But as was my brother, the adulterer, my father was adamantly loved. And not for the fact that he founded a Muhammadiyah school and became his first principal. The job might have bought him social respect, but it wasn't considered as achievement, let alone a great one. It was, in fact, his duty, given the legacy of his late father, a renowned religious leader in his day. He was laughed because he had all the smooth manners and practice accuracy demanded of his station. He had the most dazzling smile and he flirted with everybody, men, women, children, animals. He had a way with the young, a soothing charm, and he made use of it when running his school. The women had attempted to seduce or gave him the trespass, saying, it was part of his irresistible charm, while their husbands quickly dismissed such reports as excitable exaggeration on the part of their wives. For surely, our blessed Kiai Haji was merely showing us how to be caring towards all the world's creatures. I loved him too, despite his many failings and despite all the things he bungled. Except for his philandering, he never tried to be someone he wasn't. My mother was everything my father wasn't. She was the reason all five of us finished school, got jobs, and were, at least until last week, functioning relatively well in society. She wasn't just the breadwinner, cook, and necessary adornment to her husband's public persona. She was also a magician. Everything she touched, she turned into food on our table. For many years, after she stopped selling batik from door to door, she took to making and selling her own cooking oil and sweet soy sauce, niña goreng, and ketchup manis. It was naturally an inferior cooking oil and an even lesser sweet soy sauce, not thick 
or flavorful enough, more like cough syrup. But nobody's perfect. Love rejects perfection. Even then, I already understood her deal. My mother didn't care for, much less enjoy anything. Perhaps it was also her way of not feeling lack, lest she might get attached to something she actually enjoyed. She harbored no nonsense, no desire beyond her means. A Swiss Hermina Goreng and Ketchup Manis every passing year saw her making everything that people sought and sold it cheaply. Palm sugar, coconut milk, mosquito bite repellent. And now I still stock up on her favorite brands of Minyak Goreng and Ketchup Manis, the ones whose standard she used to aspire to and failed at. It was not a betrayal, it was the opposite. She would have seen it that way too. It doesn't matter that our products suck, she once told me. The key is to sell them below market price to people with very little money. People who have no money can't care less about quality. There's all the time in the world for quality. But first, you have to supply. She taught us how to live a life of lack, this pride. My mother suddenly didn't need pity or gratitude. It was enough that she turned herself into a magician, as though she had secretly prayed for it one night and woke up the next morning with the powers, no conditions attached, no questions asked. What she needed was for us to either help or shut up. I was the one who helped. By this, I meant just being nice and polite. I put on my best smile whenever I handed a customer a can of our wares. Thank you, Ba, Bu, come see us again. And I held on to some kind of wit about me whenever someone made a hurtful comment. At the end of a long day, I sometimes held massage, massage my mother's tired, tiny feet and endured her playful rebuke of me and my butterfly fingers. Mostly though, I was the one who shut up, including the time I caught my father disappearing into the house of one of our neighbors through the back door in a way I thought was odd when all the children were at school. He had all the wrong body language. What was all the creeping and eyes darting about left and right? I was the one who watched my mother stay silent in the ways and weeks to follow, not knowing whether to tell her what I had seen. I was the one who saw her one day just pick up my father's best white shirt, the one he wore to Friday prayers, and slash it calmly across the chest, thus puncturing his faith. Keeping my mouth shut somehow put an end to my father's adventures. For a while at least, he went back to a life of counselling, praying and eating home-cooked food while maintaining a low profile at the school, the mosque, the city square, places where he could pray and be seen. When my mother finally left my father, she didn't divorce him. She simply left their house in Magalang and moved to Jakarta. On our first evening together as a family in a modest rented house in Pangarang, west of Jakarta, she served the dishes she'd always cooked at a home along with our favorite local tea. I was in my second year of junior high, and those were the frangible years. I love that she'd rescued us from our horrible uncle. I love that she denied my father the right to her without ever speaking ill about him. I love that her silence didn't make her a victim. If I'd only ever able to admire her in all her valor and fidelity, and loved my father despite all his faults and indiscretions, I loved her then and forever. Truly, I loved my mother like a fountain come to life.